Okay, welcome everyone to this evening's uh, LJP Coach Education Webinar. Uh, we're back again for another webinar. Hope you're enjoying the series thus far. Uh, we're here, it's 7.30 now. We will be here for about 70 minutes. Normally these webinars are around the hour mark. We don't go over 70 minutes. So hopefully uh, you, you'll enjoy this topic this evening. Any questions throughout the webinar, guys, don't be afraid to uh, put in the chat function. I'd be happy to uh, look at them throughout the webinar and pose any questions to Teresa as we go along. So we'll use that. If you have any in, uh, issues with your, with your connectivity, uh, just leave the webinar and come back into the webinar. So we'll move on there, Teresa. So tonight's webinar is, is one of, of, of a series that we're doing over the winter. Uh, we're now on the 16th of November, which is the role of uh, athletic development in injury prevention. If you've missed our how to motivate your players through coaching or using positive coaching language in a session, they can be observed or viewed on our LJFA YouTube channel. And tonight's webinar is also recorded. So if you, get, you, know, if you miss anything, you can look back at it over the coming days on our LJFA YouTube channel. And all the other topics that we've done recently are up there. And we'd love to hear your feedback. We hope that you're enjoying them and that you're, you're learning something from them and you can take something from those various um, webinars. But you can book as, 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 as late up as to, to start the webinar. So guys, just go into the LJFA uh, website for sale. So tonight's uh, topic is the role of athletic development and injury prevention. And I'm going to welcome our guest tonight. Our guest speaker is Teresa Mullahan. How are you, Teresa? I hope you're well. Good, well yourself. Good stuff. Teresa is actually, guys, a coach developer with the LJFA. She also is a coach with the Dublin Miners and has also do a bit of coaching with Belly Borden Underage. So is there anybody from Dublin here tonight? You might know Teresa well. But she's also a GPO in her full-time job in St. Peter's, Dunboyne, in County Mead. So maybe there's a few from Mead on here tonight who might, might recognise Teresa as well. And also, she uh, teaches youth athletic development with Satanta College. So massive knowledge and experience uh, Teresa brings to tonight's uh, topic. So we're really looking forward to, to listening uh, to, to Teresa's, um, I suppose, presentation this evening. So what are our outcomes for, for this evening? We want to understand the role of athletic development in, in injury prevention, and we want to provide practical examples of how to incorporate athletic development into pitch-based coaching sessions to reduce your injury risk. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Teresa. Teresa, the very best look, and I'll manage the chat for you as we go along. Right, okay, thanks, Will. So I suppose tonight we're going to look at the role of athletic development in injury prevention. And I suppose when we think about athletic development, we, we really think about improving our, our physical performance. So developing the physical qualities of your players to make them fitter, faster, stronger, more mobile, all that kind of stuff is a key goal. And that has to be achieved if you're going to improve you know, playing performance on the pitch. However, the other part of that is injury prevention. That's equally important. So if a player is unable to train, then they're unable to develop as an athlete. And if a player doesn't develop as an athlete, then the playing performance on the pitch is likely to suffer as well. So athletic development and injury prevention are intricately related in many ways. So we have stronger, fitter and more efficient players in terms of their movement are less likely to be injured. And it's common sense that players who are injured less have more of an opportunity to get a stronger, fitter and faster. So then on the negative side of that, a team's results will often suffer as a result of increased injury rates. So oftentimes our best players are also talented in other sports and there are huge demands placed on them in terms of their training load. So that places them at increased risk of injury. And then other times, on the other side of the scale, some of our players are not well conditioned enough to meet the demands of the game, and they're also at increased risk of injury. So from a sports performance perspective, injuries are a significant barrier to a team in achieving their performance-related goals. So there's a link then between player availability and performance results, and the more successful teams have more of their players available for longer during, during the season. So the first thing we're going to look at is what's a sports injury and a sports injury can be defined as damage to the tissues of the body that occurs as a result of sport or exercise. So we're, we're more commonly talking here about musculoskeletal damage. And we've got two main types. First type is an acute injury, and that would include stuff like stra strains and sprains. So if you, if you twist your ankle or something like that, or if you pull your hamstring, and then we've got chronic or overuse injuries, and they have a more uh, gradual onset. So that would include stuff like the teller tendonitis or if you've got shin splints and, and stuff like that, that would have a more um, uh, gradual onset, be termed a chronic injury or an overuse injury. So we've got, we've got lots of different types. OK, so when we look at the demands of, of, Gaelic, of ladies, ladies Gaelic football, obviously we know it's a high intensity uh, game. There's lots of sprints, there's lots of changes of direction. 
And players have to like, they have to sprint, they have to jump, they have to land, change direction, and they have to perform the skills of the game. So like with other field invasion sports, injuries are, are relatively common. And obviously that will have negative, you know, physical, financial, maybe psychological implications. So when we look at the research in ladies Gaelic football and injury, um, we see there is not a lot of it. So most of the injury, research and in injuries to date has been predominantly on the male side of the game. Um, so there's just two retrospective studies in ladies Gaelic football, and they're from about 10 years ago. One of them was actually done in America, and the other one was done in a GP practice in, I think it was in West Cork. And those are retrospective studies. So they might not be as good at um, picking up um, injuries, or sorry, they might not be as good at picking up accurately what is actually happening in terms of injuries in our game because usually what we'll just report are the more serious injuries and we don't take account into of all the injuries that might occur during during um, the course of the season so there was a prospective study published this year by Siobhan O'Connor in DCU and that study the incidence and type of injury in colleges ladies daily football over two years so there was 81 injuries reported and in, in occurred in 75 players and 58% of players sustained an injury over the course of the, of the two year studies. So when we look at what happened, the injuries during the matches were significantly more common than in training. That's probably expect that. So there was 42.5 injuries per 1000 playing hours in matches, and there was only 7.8 in training. Um, so the injuries then were mostly acute and they were non-contact and strains and sprains were, were frequent, as you can see there at 36.7 and 17.7%. The most common mechanism of injury was running and sprinting, but injuries were also reported during landing, turning and falling, which would be all non-contact. And there was also injuries reported um, um, tackling and being tackled as well. And interestingly enough, the injuries were the most common in the final quarter of the match or training session. So this kind of, I suppose, shows us the importance of, of conditioning. Um, so then when we look at where the injuries occurred, we can see that the lower limb injuries were predominant. So hamstrings were the most frequent, followed by the knee, the quad, and the ankle. And in terms of the injury burden, then this is the number of days lost per thousand playing hours. The knee injuries were the worst. So players lost on average 107 playing, 107 playing days per thousand hours for, for knee injuries. Hamstrings were 66 days absent. Ankle injuries then were almost 40. And then concussion was near about 25 days lost. So a significant amount of playing time is lost to injury during the playing season. So obviously this is just a study in the college uh, population. So we will, I suppose, need further research into what happens at underage level, what happens at inter-county level, and what happens at adult club level as well, just to, to get, a, I suppose, a more accurate picture of, of what happens um, in, in our game in, in terms of injuries. So we look at our injury mechanisms here. So how do these injuries occur? So as coaches, we can never completely guarantee that injuries will or will not occur if, if we follow a particular training program. So there's always an inherent risk in playing sport. And risk factors in sport are any factors that can increase the potential for injury. So we've got, I suppose, two basic types. We've got intrinsic, which are you know, specific to the individual participating in the sport. And then we've got extrinsic, which would refer to stuff like the weather and field conditions and all that kind of stuff. Even within that, the risk factors can be classified as modifiable or non-modifiable. So modifiable risk factors are those that have the potential to be altered by injury prevention strategies to reduce the injury rates, and then mod non-modifiable um, risk factors can't be altered. So examples of those would be, of non-modifiable extrinsic factors would be something like, well, what, what sport you play? So we're, we're playing football, so that can't change that. Um, the level of play um, is another thing that you can't really do a lot about. So whether you're playing club or county or, or, or what division or whatever it is, um, maybe the weather at the time of day, all those kind of things you can't do anything about. Potentially modifiable extrinsic factors would include something like the rules. So maybe in training, you can modify the rules. Maybe you can reduce the playing time, uh, you know, if, if you need to do that. The playing surface, whether you're on astro or on grass or what the pitch conditions are like, um, you might be able to change that. And maybe the equipment. So it can just protective equipment in terms of mouth guards, whether you're wearing jewelry, that kind of stuff. That's an ex extrinsic factor that you, that you can control. Then when we look at the intrinsic uh, risk factors or the internal ones, some things are non-modifiable, like your age, um, whether you're male or female, or if you had a previous injury, there's nothing you can do about that. That's just there. And then the potentially modifiable on intrinsic factors, then these are the things that we will look to affect during our training sessions to reduce the injury risk. So that can be stuff like your fitness level, um, your flexibility, your strength, uh, your joint stability, uh, biomechanics, balance, proprioception. These are the things that we look to, to improve in training. 
So I suppose when we look at how the injuries occur, it's quite complex and it's quite multifactorial. And there are a lot of independent risk factors which interact with each other to cause an injury. So if you have some of these intrinsic factors, both modifiable and non-modifiable, that can predispose our players or our athletes towards an injury. Um, but having a predisposing factor is, is rarely sufficient to cause an injury on its own. Um, so then once you have these, once an athlete is predisposed to injury, then you might have extrinsic factors that will act upon them. And those factors, we call them enabling factors. So they might facilitate a manifestation of the injury. But again, those on their own are never, never usually sufficient to, to cause an injury. But what they do is they make an athlete or a player, I suppose, an accident waiting to happen as such. And then the final link in the chain is the inciting event. And that's the event that caused the injury. But without the other factors being present, the inciting incident would never have caused the injury. Hope that makes sense. So I suppose if you're looking at, if you're looking on, you know, we might say, oh, this, this player, that player was very unlucky or very unfortunate to, to sustain an injury. But there's a lot of factors that play into that before the actual, you know, inciting event actually occurs. Okay. Just so there, just, um, Teresa, before you yeah. move on, a question there from Francis, uh, just in relation to the study, uh, and she was saying that the study is done at college level. Would these stats be totally different in younger ages or more uh, with more less with less muscle development? So would these lower limb injuries occur with these younger age groups, even though they have less muscle development? I, I presume it, it is likely that it could happen because of the, the I suppose, the biomechanics of the female player. Um, it, the injuries do occur at, at younger age groups as well, Teresa. Would you be able to answer that one? Yeah, they do. And I suppose the adolescent period like, is, a, is a really like, significant time for, you know, for, for injuries as well. And we go through that in a second, what happens during growth and maturation and stuff. But uh, like, when you go back to, like, um, that was a study from DCU, so you're talking about Connor Cup players, and those would be mostly inter-county players for the most part, assuming that it was taken from their, their O'Connor Cup team. So those would probably be you know, really well-trained, really well-coached, they'd have their athletic development going on. Would you have the same thing going on at, at a club, maybe senior level or at a club junior or intermediate level? It, it's, it's, it's debatable. I suppose it depends. Depends everything, everything is it depends. Um, so there's there's lots of different reasons for the injuries. And you know, I suppose that's something that we'll need further study. We we don't know what the incidence or anything like that is in like the teenage cohort, or there's nothing published at the moment anyway, and the same with the club level. So we'll just have to, I suppose await some research on that and see what and see what how that compares with, with the college level okay so we'll just move on here to some of our risk factors for injury and again just just to delve a little bit into a couple of them so the first one here the biggest um there's consistent evidence that the strongest predictor of future injuries is a, is a previous injury so if you tear your hamstring once you're more likely to tear that again than somebody who hadn't tear, torn their hamstring for example so for example if you take an ankle sprain and say that occurred like two or three months ago, in a typical case of a recurrent ankle sprain, there'd be some weakness around the state, around the muscles of the ankle. And unless the player in, you know, engages in a rehabilitation program of strength and proprioception exercises or balance exercises before returning to play, then it's likely that that injury might occur, will occur in the future because they haven't rehabbed it properly. So it'll be a recurring one. Same thing when you, when you tear your hamstring or something like that. Like you, you, I suppose you'd expect that the body would repair the tear with new muscle, but that's not really what happens. So if you have a little tear in a muscle or a rupture, it's repaired with um, with scar tissue. And when the scar tissue forms around an injury site, it's never as strong as the as the tissue that it replaces. So it has a tendency to to contract and deform the surrounding tissues. So the strength of the tissue is diminished, but the flexibility of the tissue is also compromised. So untreated scar tissue is a is a major cause of re-injury, and it's usually a couple of months after you thought, oh my. My hammer is grand, it's, 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 it's working fine again, and then it goes again. So a previous injury is the strongest predictor of a future injury. So if you can avoid it in the first place, even better. Next thing we'll just chat about are the biomechanics. And that's how athletes use their muscles using or during athletic maneuvers. Um, and this is a big impact on the ACL injuries, which we'll know is you know, uh, fairly rampant in, in ladies Gaelic football and in all female sports. So during adolescence, um, girls have higher rates of ACL injuries compared to boys in similar sports. And that can be partly explained by anatomical and physiological changes. But there are also what we call neuromuscular differences between boys and girls that develop during puberty. And they're one of the most important factors that contribute to girls um, having an increased risk of ACL injury. So what happens during the growth sport is that girls and boys experience fairly rapid increases in body mass and height 
and then their center of gravity or their center of mass um, is raised. But boys have a surge of testosterone during that time, and that results in increased muscle mass and in strength. And that also helps them with their muscular control about the joints, and it also increases their, their core stability. And girls don't have that same burst of testosterone, so they don't experience as much muscle growth uh, as boys. So girls tend to have less effective muscular control of their joint movements, and they have decreased core stability while you know, just undergoing athletic maneuvers. And that's one of the main contributing reasons why girls have a higher ACL injury rate than, than lads. So the muscles of your hip and your trunk have a, a very important role in supporting and stabilizing the knee. And what we see with girls um, after the onset of the growth sport is that we see a lot of dynamic, what we call knee valgus. And you can see that in that girl there on, on, on the right. And if you look at the picture on the left, she's a 26 degree knee collapse. So really your knee should be over your middle toe, hip over knee over ankle kind of thing in a proper alignment with a neutral pelvis. You can see her hip has dropped because the muscles of the trunk and the hip aren't able to actually hold her in, in, in a good posture and her knee is collapsing in. And that is one of the, the major risk factors then for, um, for ACL injury. That's also a big factor in the telofemular um, syndrome as well, which is just like tendinitis of, of the knee. So what we try and do with players like that is, as part of our warm up especially, is to put exercises in that will help mitigate that. So that involves strengthening exercises for the hip and the core. We have to do plyometrics, which is just repeated jumping exercises. And then it's really important that we educate the player as to what proper alignment looks like. So like hip over knee over ankle that, we're, that our knee isn't collapsing in. Um, so that, that's very important. Another big risk. Just there, uh, Teresa, before yeah. we move on, um, Maura asked, what is ACL? Anterior cruciate ligament is yeah. what it is, Maura. Yeah, yeah sorry, so. I should have said that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so your ACL, yeah, it's your anterior cruciate ligament. So basically, if you think about the way, um, you know, your shin bone and your fem femur are, are kind of connected and your knees in, kind of in the middle there with the kneecap in front, and you've got four ligaments that keep the knee stable. So the one to the outside is called the lateral ligament. The one to the inside of the knee is called the medial. And then if you can imagine just behind the kneecap, there's like two ligaments that cross over in the form of an X, kind of like that. And the one to the front is called the anterior cruciate ligament and the one behind is called the posterior. So the anterior cruciate ligament has a major role in stabilizing the knee so that it does like it's a hinge joint. So it's kind of supposed to go, I suppose, mainly in one direction, kind of flex and extend. It's not meant to wobble all over the place. And those four ligaments give it um, support. Um, so if you tear that, then your knee just goes all wobbly and it's a horrible injury to get. And anybody who's had it, you know, they've been out for guts of a year. There's, there's a lot of consequences to an ACL injury. So that is something we, we definitely need to need to try and prevent if, if we can, or at least reduce the chances of it, of it happening. OK, so we move on then to early sports specialization. And this is now this is not so much to do with the ACL. But this is where we engage in one sport at like, you know, for, for the whole year and we train for that sport for the whole year and we don't engage in any other sports. So that's a risk factor for overuse injuries because you're using the same movement patterns over and over and over again. And that's a risk factor independent of how much of it you do, independent of your training volume. So if we participate in multiple sports, especially as children and as, as adolescents up until about the late teens, that facilitates the transfer of skills just from one sport to another. And in doing so, that can promote, I suppose, better athletic, youth athletic development and special, specialization does. So players who participate in a variety of sports, they expose their growing body to a wider range of physical challenges, and that can result in a little bit more balanced, I suppose, neuromuscular development, and there's less repetitive stress, and that will reduce the, the risk for injury then. So children like should engage in multiple sports and delay specialization until late adolescence. Then sleep is another risk factor for injury or lack of sleep. So those who get more than eight hours of sleep per night on typical weekdays have uh, reduced odds of sustaining an injury as well. So that's just a, that's a little, that's an easy fix, like, you know, that one to get, get eight hours of sleep. And then last thing we're going to go on to here is growth and maturation. We're just going to talk about this a little bit um, because it's very important in terms of uh, the teenage athlete and what happens. So if we look at the graph here on the left, we can see that there are two periods of rapid growth in a, in a child's lifetime. So the first one is from birth until about two years of age. And the second one then is at the onset of the adolescent growth spurt. So risk of injuries um, increases with age across all kinds of studies and all kinds of sports. So adolescents are at greater risk of injury than, than younger children. So after the initial early growth spurt from not two years of age, children on average grow about five centimeters a year. And then when we hit peak height velocity or PHV, that's the period of maximal growth during the adolescent growth spurt. 
and that will usually occur between the ages of 10 and 12 for girls and 12 to 14 for boys. They're, they're two years later. You can see them in the black graph and the girls are in the, the green. So in that period during peak height velocity, um, players can, or players' children can grow up to maybe eight to 10 centimeters a year. So it's, it's a rapid rate of growth. Now, obviously this doesn't happen to everybody to, the, to, that, to that extent. But during that growth sport, what's interesting is when you're from not to two years of age, like your trunk grows first and then your limbs catch up. But that's reversed during the adolescent growth sport. So the arms and legs grow first and then the trunk catches up with that. And then what happens 12 months afterwards, we hit, we hit peak weight velocity. So that means we've got taller first and then I suppose we kind of fill out a little bit um, 12 months later. But what happens because the limbs have grown prior to, I suppose, the muscular strength, um, we can get like temporary loss of coordination. So we, we refer to it like as adolescent awkwardness. And you can I think you can just picture players like that who look like they're they're a little bit all over the place in terms of their their movement control and, and their coordination. So when that happens, it disrupts our motor control and movement patterns. And then again, that will increase the risk of injury as well. So the other thing too with PHV is that players who are going through that, especially if they're going through rapid growth, they can might get um, you are be more prone to injuries such as Osgood Schlatter's or Severs disease. So those are basically growth injuries in the knee. So it's like tendonitis of the knee and you can get the same thing then Severs is in your heel. And that and they can get spread sensations of tightness and pain. And that's just simply due to the rapid rate of growth. So the bones are growing rapidly and the muscles don't grow at quite the same rate. And that just causes a sensation of tightness and that can impact performance as well. So then during this stage, we have to be very careful that we monitor what our, our teenage athletes are doing because we have, to, we have to monitor their, their loading patterns. And we need to spend a lot of time working on their mobility and on their core stability. So that's to give the muscles as much support as possible and um, to adapt to the new range of motion required. So we want these players to get through this period with as little discomfort as, as possible. So if we do, I suppose, our job properly as child coaches, we'll have developed their fundamental movement skills and that makes this period a lot easier to manage than if they didn't have their fundamental movement skills um, developed. Okay, so what happens to female athletes post PHV? So once they've gone through the growth, or while they're going through the growth sport and after it, a number of changes take place. So I suppose, first of all, females will reach um, physiological maturity um, before males do. They have, like, we have more body fat than, than males. So again, in terms of athleticism, it's better to have more muscle, muscle than fat, obviously. Um, as a result of hormonal differences, then, so that's like between, we would produce more estrogen, lads would produce more testosterone, but what that does as well is it makes our joints a little bit um, more lax. And so that would predispose us to, I suppose, sprains and stuff like that at that particular joint and the surrounding tissue as well sometimes gets damaged. Uh, females have less upper body strength than fellas. So even with training, it, it remains 30 to 50% less than that of males. So lower extremity strength, lower extremity strength then that, that's much closer. Um, then anatomically, females have a wider pelvis than males. So that creates a larger Q angle. So what's that? That's the angle at which your femur meets, meets the tibia. And again, just going back to that last um, picture where we had the girl with the knee valgus, having a, a larger Q angle predisposes female athletes to that knee valgus. So that means that sometimes when we're running or jumping or landing or whatever it is, our, knee, our knees cave in. And again, that's a big risk factor for, for ACL tears. So female athletes are two to eight times more likely to suffer an ACL tear than, than the lads are. And you don't see differences in that like prior to, to puberty or on peak height velocity. So then we have another thing called ligament dominance, and that's more common in females and males. And that again is closely linked with ACLs. So that occurs when the muscles surrounding a joint don't perform their job of stabilizing and, and absorbing forces during, during landing or cutting or sidestepping. And so the ligaments take over that role then. So then it's important for us in terms of our training that we that we develop the, the, the posterior chain muscles, which is basically the glutes, the hamstrings, so everything that, that's behind. And that's important for, for lower limb control and to avoid that ligand, ligament dominance. And then our next thing then is quad dominance. So again, that's an imbalance in the, in the strength between the quads and the hamstrings during various sporting movements. So again, this is another thing that females are more predisposed than, than, than fellas are. And you'll see this, how this will look like, what it will look like would be a straight-legged landing from a jump. So that will be sometimes caused by um, quad, quad dominance. And again, that's something that doesn't happen um, prior to PHV. And then the last little thing that happens is, well, it's the big thing, it's uh, core dysfunction or, or trunk dominance. And that means we have a lesser ability to control our trunk um, in three-dimensional space. So we have poor trunk um, proprioception. So again, females have less control over their trunk than what the lads would, again, just 
probably due to less muscle mass. And again, so when we get a little disturbance during landing or jump like that, and if we can not control our trunk and keep ourselves aligned, then that makes us um, more predisposed to an ACL injury. So there's, there's a lot of stuff going on there post um, PHV and post that growth sport that we just, just have to be mindful of. Just before I move on, Teresa, a question came in from Riedel there in regards to early specialization. And she mentioned that Gaelic, soccer and running are very similar uh, to an 11 year old. So you're talking about, I suppose, uh, exposing players to multiple sports. But if the sports are very similar in their actions or their, I suppose, mechanisms, do you, when you say, I suppose, multiple sports, do you say outside, you know, ones that are less similar, like Gaelic and soccer, like basketball and other sports? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so basketball would be, okay, like that would be a good example of a sport that would transfer over, like, you know, in terms of catching. But like maybe if you're with a basketball coach, they might teach you how to sidestep properly or they might teach you how to, you know, to land from a jump because that would be a big, a big part of basketball. Um, like soccer would be kind of, I suppose, yeah, similar to us in that it's a field-based sport, but maybe another sport that they could do that would be very different might be swimming. Maybe with athletics, if you were doing sprinting, you'd be definitely teaching you how to march and, and, and skip and do all those kind of, kind of things. Um, and I suppose athletics in, includes the throwing events as well. So that would be different. Maybe if you were doing a martial art or something like that. Um, so there's lots of different, different types of sports that kids should sample. Um, when, when they're younger so to, to take those take the skills of basketball bring them to Gaelic football maybe whatever it is like a, whatever and it, that a lot of that will depend on what's available in your area and what you what you're able what you're able to do so yeah having the same the exact same movement patterns isn't a good idea but if it could be some little bit different um, just to get a, 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 a wider exposure I suppose to different movement patterns and another question before we move it on so would you would you advocate just looking at you know this growth mat maturation Early specialization, I suppose, you know, we probably judge players very early. This slide here tells me that don't judge players early because there's so much going on in their lives between or their, their growth and development between 10 and 14. Whoa, if we start judging players early, then we could be actually doing them a small bit of a disservice based on this slide here, Teresa. Would that be true or false? I'd say that that's that's spot on, Will, like because you know you've a you've a you've a child player coming in there at 10 or 11 and then Maybe, maybe six months later, maybe a year later, maybe even two years later, it depends, because this is another thing I sh should have mentioned there, that like each child will grow and develop at, at their own rate. So we do have early developers, we have kind of average onset developers, and then we have late developers. And sometimes the late developers are are the real gems of players, like, you know, that. so you shouldn't judge them too soon, because there's an awful lot that has to happen in between them going through, going from childhood in, in through that growth sport and, and out the other side of it. And just, it's not even just the physical stuff, it's their interests and everything like that change as well. Um, you know, as they go through those teenage years. So it's not just completely physical. There's there's other stuff as well. Like, Yeah, there's motivation and stuff in that. No, thank you very yeah. much. I think that's a good answer. Thank you. Okay. So, so just getting back then to the importance and the need for physical preparation. So I suppose as coaches, as we know, we have a wide variety and standard of players coming through our gates. And some of them are here for the, for the social aspect and for the chats as much as for the football. And they might only engage in physical activity once or twice a week while you're training. And... Like it's recommended that children and youth get 60 minutes daily of moderate to vigorous physical activity for health, not to mind the fitness requirements of playing Gaelic football. So inadequate physical preparation plays a role in a lot of um, sports related injuries. So if you're like, if you're fatigued, that places, you know, your players at greater risk of injury and, and like tired players in the latter stages of the game are more likely to sustain an injury than, than when they were fresh. And then likewise, players are more likely to be injured early in the season when their fitness levels might be up to standard, say, if you're talking about like maybe adult players after, after Christmas and stuff like that. Um, and then on the other side of it, we've got the players who are doing too much, right? So too much of the same stuff. Um, but even despite that, like we can have very talented footballers, but they might have actually very poor movement skills. So that's something we need to bear in mind that they're not one and, of, one and, one and the same thing. Um, so, and I, and I would see that would even within, within a county set up, like some outstanding footballers but when you actually ask them to squat and to lunge and to do all those basic movement patterns they're quite poor at it and um, so this is something that we, we would need to you know to kind of attack with them to make sure that their that their movement capabilities or that their movement competence is is up to scratch so that they don't get injured um, oh, I suppose it, could, it, could, it, could, it could be that player whereby playing multiple with multiple teams playing loads of football but probably not developing physically as they should be because they're missing out on that that key training phase, Teresa. Would that be would that be what you're saying there? 
Yeah, that's it. And do, I suppose the other thing too is do I suppose, and we'll get to this later. Just making sure that we that we incorporate some elements of athletic development into all of our sessions. And so again, we're not going to talk here as an SNC coach, but as what can we do as coaches on on the pitch to just make sure that this has been tipped at all the time and that we can encourage that that athletic development and help the players through that. Um. So that that's our, our our second our second type of player who's doing too much sport specific stuff, but not enough actual like athletic development to support them through all the the, the teams and 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 training sessions and matches and everything like that that they have to play. Um. So again, these are the ones where we have to really monitor their training loads and make sure that they're not doing too much. And that might be like you can have, you have different ways of doing it, but one of the simplest ones might be just talking to the might be actually the most simple one, but talking to the coaches of your other sports. How many nights are you training football? How many soccer are you doing? How many camogie are you doing? Whatever it is, do I need to be doing six, seven, eight sessions a week? Um, can I cut back on that? Especially as they're going through that growth sport when they're more prone to those um, overuse injuries and everything like that. Okay, so that's our physical prep, the need for it. And now we're going to look at, okay, what's, what is it, athletic development? And there's a big definition here of it. So it's the systematic, sequential and progressive development of all athletic qualities in an integrated manner to develop the complete athlete. So it incorporates a balanced development of all components of physical performance, strength, power, speed, agility, endurance, and flexibility. And the important thing is that you don't emphasize one over the other, that there's balance um, in all of them. So the, the whole aim of athletic development, I suppose, is to build solid foundations of athleticism. So if you look over here to the right, we have all these exercises here, and I know there's big fancy names in these, but these are what we call our athletic motor skill competencies. And these are basically foundational movements that underpin all athletic movements. So most athletic tasks will typically use a combination of these movements. So if you take the, the skill of sidestepping, that involves, right, you'll have to decelerate, then you'll have to re-accelerate back in a new direction, like, and it, that's done off one leg. So that's shown there in the graph where you see a uh, lower body unilateral and also combined in with, with, with your core stability as well, anti-rotation and core bracing. So the two of those, I suppose, motor skill competencies combined will be the foundation of a sidestepping maneuver. Um, then if you take something like um, the high catch, well, that involves jumping off the ground on one or two legs, whichever, most mostly one, to get airborne. And then you have to be able to, to safely tolerate the landing forces when you impact on the ground. So that might be on one or two legs as well. So you've a, a load of athletic motor skill competencies combined here. So you've got acceleration, you have bilateral or unilateral lower body force, you have jumping, you have catching, you have core bracing, you have landing, and you have re-acceleration. And all those um, competencies should be developed in all of our players, all of our athletes. Um, it's actually rega irregardless of what, of what sport they play. So I suppose for, for our young athletes, they will be exposed to a range of movements within a sport because it's like it's, it's chaotic and it's it's reactive and there's lots of changes of direction and there's lots of things to do in, in terms of skill and in terms of movement within our sport. So if if we look at our athletes, then during the growth sport, they will have reduced neuromuscular control. So then these youth athletes will have a greater chance of getting picking up an injury during this during this period. So we have to make sure that our athletes, I suppose, are are strong and robust enough to tolerate the, the, the loads of landing and jumping and cutting and sidestepping and all that. So it's important that our athletes, I suppose, become technically competent in those skills so that they can um, produce force and absorb force. Um, and it, that's across all those, those competencies there in, in the spectrum. Okay. Now, if we were to build an ideal athlete, what we'd want to see would be on the left. And that's this is where good movement would underpin everything that we do as an athlete. So I suppose the bigger and the deeper the base, the higher the peak, the more we can build on top of it. So the bottom layer there is about good movement and it underpins everything. So that would consist of mobility and stability. Now we have an active range of motion for functional movements, or sorry, mobility is the active, active range of motion for functional movements. And then stability is the ability to maintain your posture and balance during athletic movement. So therefore training to build young athletes should start at the foundation um, of the athleticism period, pyramid and build upwards. The next layer up from that then we have is performance. And this is all about strength, power, speed, agility, and coordination. And really, we can only optimally develop those qualities if we've got good movement competence. And then the cherry on the top then is the skill or the, or the sport itself. So I suppose there's no point really in trying to impose sport-specific training on flawed movement patterns because it's going to lead to a breakdown you know, in, term, in terms of injury and stuff like that. And we should progress our exercises then appropriately depending on, on the competence, of, the movement competence of, of the players that we have. 
then the pyramid on the right is I suppose is what we re what we really see and, and the pyramid is basically upside down and that's because we sometimes play an excess amount of sport but we don't have a wide enough base of movement so that means that performance can't be trained to its full capacity so I suppose it's important that we get that pyramid the right way up and that we develop that appropriately all through all through the player pathway so the foundation for athletic development is movement so building a foundation of movement skill and strength is is really important to improving performance um, so a broad foundation of basic movement skills that will support greater efficiency and progress on, on the sport specific skills. So, right, next thing. Where do we go from here with all that theory done? <laughs> what should I be doing with my, with, with my players? I want just have a quick look here at the player pathway. So this, I suppose, is a player pathway. Is, it's just it's a model of athletic development, I suppose, or athlete development. And it's, it's just a guide to help coaches deliver age and developmentally appropriate coaching. So we look at our Gaelic um, games pathway here, and this is like the GAA, the LGFA, and, and the Camogie Association have combined to do, the, to, to do this together. We have three main phases. We have foundation, which is the F1. So this will anything that pertains to club. So F1, F2, and F3 pertains to the club. Then we've got um, the talent ones. That would be players that would be um, involved in talent academies or, or maybe um, inter-county underage squads and stuff like that. And then elite performance then would be um, senior inter-county. So when we look at the player pathway, you see the F1 there is all about the development of fundamental movement skills, okay? And that's where children participate in activities that are enjoyable, they're rewarding to them, and we establish a core set of motor skills that are related to Gaelic games early in life. So that's our agility, balance, coordination, running, jumping, catching, passing, kicking, striking, all that kind of stuff. Then we move on to um, F2, and then that talks about extension and refinement of movement. So this is where we combine our fundamental movement skills with our sport specific skills, so the skills of the game. And then we move then into F3, which is um, you know, where we're committed to our Gaelic games lifestyle. So we've, we've learned all our movement skills and our sport specific skills at that child age. And then we take them onto a higher level then at the club, whether that's going all the way up to you know, senior club or whether it's you know, playing, playing with your junior team or whatever it is. But if you have those fundamental movement skills and your sport specific skills, then you should be able to partake in Gaelic games at whatever your level is, whether that's at junior, intermediate, senior, whatever it is. So if we break things down into what should we be doing at um, in, in terms of physical, and this here is the composite youth physical development model, and that was developed by, by, by Lloyd et al. And it's interesting because this just, I suppose it's mostly taken the physical here, which is on the bottom, okay? And if you look at the size of the font in the writing, you can see that the bigger the writing, the more important it is to emphasize that particular attribute at that stage. So if you look there, um, early childhood, middle childhood, so the ages from two to about seven or eight, you can see that FMS is in big writing. So we really need to concentrate on fundamental movement skills at that age. But you can see then as well, even as the player moves all the way up into adulthood, we still do FMS, fundamental movement skills, but we, we don't place as big an emphasis on them because again, we should have them development, developed at, at the child level. As the child gets older, then you can see the SSS is the sport specific skills that gets a little bit bigger in front. So that becomes more important into later childhood. So again, going back to your pyramid, develop the movement skills first and then the sport specific skills, then peg on to the top of that. And it makes things an awful lot easier for yourself. If you can run, if you can, if you can jump, if you can catch, it makes skills of the game like the high catch or something like that an awful lot easier to, to teach. And on that one, Teresa, do you know, you know, we've a lot of coaches that maybe here that, that coach academy level, you know, and they're the six and seven, eight, the six and seven year olds, you know, and they're and maybe five and six, and, and they're worried about, geez, they should be hand passing and kicking now. Really, it's about from looking at this graph, it's about that fundamental building that base of fundamental movement skills, uh, to be able to throw, to kick, to, to turn, to twist, to lend. That's probably more important, and not worry too much about the sport specific skills until later on. Exactly. And I suppose I'd be sick and tired of saying this like up and down going, but like you have 15 years really to make a senior player from, you know, from if they come into you at five, they're thereabouts. There's no hurry to be going on to the hand pass and the kick pass and the solo and all that kind of stuff. There's loads of time. You've, you've the goal games, you've everything like that to develop that. But developing the fundamental movement skills is very important. And it makes your life teaching the sport specific skills a lot easier if you, if you can do those, because our sport specific skills are really just a number of fundamental movement skills put together. Uh, the other thing to notice there is is on strength and you can see strength it's really important that we develop strength all through childhood into adolescence all the way into into adulthood and like 
there's really positive correlations between strength and development of your fundamental movement skills, between strength and acceleration, between strength and maximum speed, between strength and agility, power, uh, plyometric capabilities and endurance, and also in reducing injury risk. Um, so strength is really important. I know sometimes when you think kids and resistance training and all that kind of stuff, people kind of go, oh, geez, we can't be doing that. But it's doing it in an age appropriate and developmentally appropriate way. And we'll, we'll look at an example of that towards the end of how you can build strength in kids in a, in a fun way um, uh, late, later on. OK, so just moving on from that, then our injury prevention programs. So there's a lot of them. Um, so there's some like the GA15, which some of you will probably have heard of, you know, the FIFA 11 plus, there's one up in the north as well from the Sports Institute there. I think the Camogie Association have one. I think the LGFA are developed from one now. So there, there's there's a lot of them there, but they're all based on the same types of, of I suppose, exercises and competencies that we need to develop. So they're usually based on this, this another big word called um, integrated neuromuscular training. So what, what's that? So that's basically a training program that would incorporate like general and specific strength conditioning activities. So the general ones would be your fundamental movement skills and the specific then would be your sport specific movements. So it would include stuff like dynamic stability, balance, core strength, plyometrics, agility exercises. Um, and the whole idea of it is that we you know, enhance our health and skill related physical fitness components and also to reduce injuries. So yeah, agility, balance, power, stability, all those kind of exercises will, will be involved in this. So there's two ways we can do this. And this is what we're just going to look at tonight is how can we integrate that into a, a pitch-based session without going into the gym? So look, we can do this part of a warm-up. That'll be usually your 10 to 25 minutes, depending um, prior to your, your pitch session. And then we can also do this as a standalone session, which could be a, like a gym session or something like that. So we, we leave that one alone for tonight. We'll just look at the stuff on, on the pitch. So how can we integrate these injury prevention programs as part of our, our warm up really is where the key is. <clears throat> right. So I suppose when we arrive at our training sessions, we're usually concerned with the skills and the tactics of the game. And we might feel that we have time to incorporate athletic development into our session. So that's the question. How do we incorporate this into our session while leaving time to develop the, the skills and the tactics and whatever else um, in, in the game? So if you have a well planned warm up, that, that's key to it, because that has the potential to prepare your athletes both physically and mentally, but also to reduce the likelihood of injury and improve their performance as well. So the same exercises do both, which is important to remember. So I suppose back in the day, a warm-up would have been a couple of laps around the field. Then we'd have some fairly poorly coached static stretching. Um, and we know that that type of a warm-up doesn't help prevent against injury. Okay, so it's really important that as coaches, we understand the importance of the potential of a well-designed warm-up if you're going to maximize the athletic potential of your of your players and, and to reduce their injury. So your warm-ups will usually last what 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on the length of your session and all that kind of stuff. So that means that all the content you have to really think about and plan it in for that short period of time. So if you think about the potential for your warm-up and athletic development, if you're doing like a 15-minute warm-up and you're training twice a week and you're doing that for 12 weeks, then that's six hours of really good quality athletic development, provided it's 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 planned it's planned properly, <clears throat> and it's really important as well that we that we coach the technique as well. Okay, so what does a good warm up look like? And it it follows this principle, which is called the RAMP. And RAMP stands for raise, activate, and mobilize, and potentiate, or or go into performance. Now, the raise part is the first bit that we do, and that would have traditionally been the couple of laps around the field. Um, but that's really, to me, that, that's a waste of valuable training time. So the aim of the, the raise part of the warm up is that we raise our body temperature, our heart rate, our core temperature, our blood flow and our joint viscosity. So we can do that in, in a lots of different ways. So you can perform exercises or simplified sport specific movements that you will that you're also going to do during the session. So you can do like low intensity, intensity, multidirectional movements like change of direction stuff. You can do dynamic range of motion exercises. You can do stuff like a and B skips, you can do like loads of stuff like that. You can do plan change direction drills, or you can go into a small sided game with at a relatively low intensity, which we will then build up. So something like as simple as a hand passing game, um, 5v5 or something like that in, in an area where you're getting the skills of the game, you're getting your touches, all that kind of stuff. And you don't have to go mad in it, um, but just use that to just get a little bit out of breath, get your core temperature up and let that run for, for three or four minutes. So that's a far more effective way of or you, or you can even play a fun game, depending. Um, so that's a far more effective way of, of, of getting that raised part done. 
um, because you're mimicking the sport specific movements of the game in a low intensity way. And that, that's been specific to the session that, that's going to follow. The next part, part then is activate and mobilize. So there's key muscles that we have to activate and that would be stuff like um, your glutes, your core, all that kind of stuff. And then we have to mobilize other joints. So like something like your hip, um, your shoulder, all that kind of stuff. So the stuff you might be doing here will be balance work. You could be doing supermans, you could be doing inchworms, you could be doing your squats and lunges and um, your sumo shuffles, maybe spinal mobility exercises, all those kind of things. And you will use that for them, like these exercises, every, everybody will do them. But then um, once you've that done, there will be some athletes that need to do specific ones for themselves. So you give them a little bit of time to do that. So if maybe somebody who has a little bit of a, a tight hamstring or something like that, they might need to do a little bit of work on that or somebody else might need to work on their hip mobility, whatever it is. So the individual preparation is important here. So I suppose then just for you as a coach, there's lots of different exercises you can use for these. So if you have a little bank of them so that you're not doing the same thing all the time, so you have an exercise for your, for your, for your um, whatever your lunges this week. Can you do a variation on it? Maybe when you need to progress it or or regress it, whichever, um, in a couple of weeks' time, just just to vary it up so it doesn't become boring by doing the same thing, um, all the time. And then your last part then is your potentiate or your performance. So this is where we up the intensity of the of the warm up so that the players are at the pitch of the training or the match that is to follow. So we're really talking about priming our athletes here. So what you can do here, you can do your plyometric stuff. So you can do your jumps, you can do bounding, you might do short little sprints here, you might do one-on-one -on -one tackling drills here, you might do reactive agility drills, or you might do some sort of evasion games which are just which are just chaotic. Um, so now we're ready for the demands of the game, or, or we're ready mentally and physically for the game. So that's what, that's our ramp protocol for a good warm-up. And these are again, these are just the like these are freely available on the internet. If you want to take any of these, you can see there with the 11 plus in the, mid, in the middle, they have like a level one, two and three. So you can, you know, you can progress that. The same with the activate one. I think they have, um, they have a, a different variation of it. So you can just vary it up so it doesn't become boring. So I suppose the real potential for variant stuff is in the raise part. You can do any activity there that will, that will achieve those aims. Then you, you really need to, to hit the activate and mobilize um, exercises but you again you, you have choice in what you do depending on the level of your player there and those they're they're available guys uh, on the ga and um, the, the ga e-learning website you can there's videos available and those templates are available and also on our ljfa website as well mm -hmm. we have uh, information regarding injury prevention and, and potential warm -up. so they're already available but um if you want to contact me afterwards I'll, I'll put you in the right direction okay Teresa. okay so that's that's how we can you know, you use an effective warm up to train all those kind of neuromuscular components. And then the last thing, I suppose, is our metabolic conditioning or basically our fitness levels. OK, so obviously, as we play the game, we need to be aerobically and anaerobically fit, because if we're not that, then we have an increased risk of injury. So the intensity, the duration, the volumes and all that kind of stuff will alter as a player grows and mature. So like if you have children, children have, would have a lower capacity for anaerobic exercise than adolescents would. So at this stage, it would be for them, it would be just aerobic in nature. But what do you do in terms of aerobic stuff? So you can do stuff like your fun games, your small sided games, you can do obstacle courses, you can do kind of skill development stuff as well. Um, so that would just, and the good thing about that is that the kids can self-regulate. So when they need to stop, they'll stop and then they go again. That's the nature of, of how kids, develop, um, you know, that's the nature of their aerobic capacity, I suppose, when they're younger, that they stop and go, they take a rest, then they're off again. Um, and then for the, the adolescent or, or the adult player, then we have a greater capacity, I suppose, for um, anaerobic development. Then once we get once we get past that PHV because of the physiological changes that occur during adolescence. So um, adolescent players will be more responsive to anaerobic training. So anaerobic training, different types of methods you can use for that. But it's really important that we do it because all the, the game defining moments in a game, like stuff like winning a ball or making a tackle, um, sprinting, all that kind of stuff. They're all anaerobic in nature. And then we need to be aerobically fit so that we can keep repeating the anaerobic efforts during the game without getting fatigued and tired and, and increasing our injury risk. So ways you can do that, you have your HIT, which is your high intensity interval training. So that could be like 15 seconds of high intensity with uh, running, maybe sprinting or something like that with, with 30 seconds active recovery, hand passing in pairs for your recovery. Off we go again and we repeat a certain number of sets and reps in those. The other thing we could do is repeated sprint training. So we do 10 reps of 30 meter sprints, do a 30 meter sprint, take 30 second recovery, do it again. And the aim would be that you can do it as quickly for the 10th rep as you do for the, the first rep. And that takes time to develop as well. 
And then the other way of developing um, anaerobic conditioning would be through small sided games. And these can be very intense, like 3v3s, sort of four sets of maybe one, two, three minutes again, progressing up um, in, in, a, in a tight playing area. And the advantage of those is you're getting decision making, you're getting the skills of the game under speed, fatigue, and pressure, um, which is really important. So it's very specific to the sport. So the, the other thing that you can do then is you can manipulate the size of the pitch. So if you have a bigger pitch, you might have a more of an aerobic component, a smaller pitch, which is tighter, and would it be far more intense on, on a 3v3, then you can um, use that for, for anaerobic conditioning. Um, so like by manipulating those pitch sizes, the rules, all that kind of stuff, you can develop your players aerobically, aerobically, and you can get your heart rate up to 85 to 95% of your heart rate max. So again, developing your players aerobically and anaerobically. And that's important that they can withstand the demands of the game. I think, okay. uh, Teresa, as you go into the final few slides, uh, you know, in my own session, what you just highlighted there, you know, to get, you know, that, that I suppose, aerobic um, a session in, we, we do that 4v4 or 3v3 over a 60 by 30 pitch, like, and, you know, it's as good as doing <laughs> any physical training, you know, so, yeah. So just yeah. Fergus McCormick there, before we move on to the last few slides, um, um, uh, Teresa, aerobic and anaerobic, just very briefly, what do they mean? Explain the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. <laughs> okay, so aerobic involves the use of oxygen and anaerobic is without the use of oxygen. Um, so aerobic stuff would be like your heart rate would get up, I suppose, to maybe 60, 70, 80% of, of 60, 75% of your heart rate max. So you should be able in aerobic type training, you should be a bit puffed, but able to carry out a conversation, I suppose. For the anaerobic, you're gasping, right? <laughs> it, it's a lot higher intensity. You're working it near your maximum capacity. So basically, you don't have you don't have time to take in enough oxygen and to kind of you know get, get the the energy required for the demands of the sprint or the jump or whatever it is you're you're doing. And and you'll really notice the difference. Like when it's anaerobic, you just can't talk, and, and that's the easiest way to to kind of explain it. Mm. Um, aerobic is a, li a little bit less intense, but you still feel like you're working hard. But you won't be able to sustain anaerobic activities for very long because what happens is you can't maintain the intensity and then you like if, if you think about if you were being chased by a tiger you go flat out but if if it was anything longer than maybe 60 70 80 meters you'd start to slow down and that's when you're going from your anaerobic to your aerobic kind of i suppose you know gen generation of energy and stuff like that so i suppose the best way to describe it is kind of you know your 100 meter sprinter versus your 1500 meter runner yeah. you know what i mean you know yeah different exactly. different uh, like your anaerobic is your 100 meter sprinter your your aerobic is your your 1500 meter sp yeah. uh, runner um, so short sharp short. intense first and then like it's it, it's flat out though it is it's 100 yeah. percent effort like whereas the aerobic then is is not quite at that intensity, but you still feel like you're working hard when you're yeah. doing it. The player that can go all day, Teresa. The player that can go all yeah. day. Your, your nippy corner forward is your anaerobic player. Um, Michelle, you had the slides are available. Well, we'll have this recorded, so it'll be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. And Jane Hall asked the question, is circuit training advisable, uh, Teresa? Um, yeah, circuit training is brilliant, especially like, you know, a lot of teams do that in the off season and it's a brilliant way to prepare your muscles, your ligaments, your tendons, and you get the cardiovascular effect as well in it. Um, in the in the off season so yeah it's fantastic but I suppose the thing with it is a lot of what we do a lot is we'll do it for the six or eight weeks at the start of the season and then we leave it and we don't do it again and the thing then is we we will detrain like there's a kind of a principle of, of training that if, if you don't keep it up or if you don't progress it and adapt it and vary it and stuff like that and, and progressively overload it the training effects are going to be lost so you can imagine we took that principle to running and you decided to go off running for six weeks and then for the next you know 40 whatever 46 weeks of the year you decided not to run you're not going to be at the same level of fitness as what you were so it's something that you have to you have to keep doing and I suppose that's where it's it's very useful if you have someone who you know if you can go into the gym and stuff like that and, and keep those good movement patterns developed and and keep working on your mobility and stability and all that kind of stuff so yeah the so circuits are brilliant circuits are good and I suppose it's how it's you know it's incorporated throughout the year so Teresa so tell us how does this look like on a, you know, in a, in a session plan um, to be before we wrap it up? Um, I'm looking forward to hearing how it works there. Right. So I've just done out, I suppose, there are just two sample sessions. It's just to give you ideas. And I suppose it's just the principle of it. So this is kind of the, the principle of how it works. So we've done gone through the ramp, which is raise, activate, mobilize and, and prepare or potentiate. And then this is another little thing that you can add on to in, into it. So if you're doing a football session, your activity then, OK, what, what's the main point of my session? 
what games can I use then? And then we look and evaluate the session. So we've gone through all our neuromuscular adaptations and everything like that in the, in the first four parts. And now for the activity in the games, we're looking to incorporate the skills, the tactics, whatever it is, and then the fitness components as well. So we'll get that in based on, you know, whatever, provided we use suitable activities and games. So I'll just show you an under eight session and then a kind of a, a, a youth adult session after that. So this is our under eight session. So the technical challenge, the skill we're going to work on tonight is the hand pass. From the physical point of view, we're going to work on agility, cutting, dodging, and evasion, psychosocial, like positive attitude to sport. And at the end of the session, I want my players to be able to hand pass to a moving target, which would be like their teammates. I want them to be able to dodge and evade others and objects, maybe if, there's, if we're playing something like dodgeball. And then we want them to keep working when they're, when they're unsuccessful. So that's the aims of our session. So for our warm up, the raise part, we're going to play fishes and sharks. Okay. And again, this is just an open space with two end zones. You've got a number of players, you're nominated them as the sharks, and the fish have to get to the end zone without getting caught. So that's a fun way to engage your players at the start of the session. And we're, we're fulfilling that requirement to, to raise our heart rate, raise our, our temperature, raise our, our core temperature, raise our respiratory rate, all that kind of stuff. Um, next thing then is we're going to activate and mobilize. And because these are kids, we're not going to do like formal squats and lunges. We're going to do a stepping stone course. So we're going to put out like a number of spot markers or cones or something like that. And we're going to get them to lunge or maybe just call it a monster walk um, across the stepping stones. Or we might get them to hop. So again, we're getting some of those fundamental movement skills in. And it's a bit, it's a bit of fun for them as well. And we looked, asked them to vary the movements and show us different ways you can do it. And you hop from your right leg to your left leg. So that'd be kind of a leap. And then maybe from your left to your left, all that kind of stuff, or maybe give them little targets as well. Then we're going to want to potentiate. So we're just going to do a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of fun speed work with them. So we're just going to go in trees in a triangle. So we've one, one runner and two holding a tennis ball, and then they just react to the tennis ball and try and get it before the, before the ball hits the ground the second or third time or whatever it is. So it's all about the intent to get to the ball here. And again, this is just a, a bit of fun as well, but we're working on the acceleration um, here and then reaction speed as well. And then we're going into, I suppose, so that's all our that's all our athletic development done there in 18 minutes. And now we're going into like our skills. So now we're going into what we're doing, we're going to practice our hand pass, but let's say we did it last week and we want to revise it. Now we're going to practice on left and right sides. We'll focus on our head, hands and feet. And now we might just bring it into a little bit more for them. So we're going to do a hand pass relay rate. So can you do it now under a little bit of speed? And um, then we might move then from that into a game. So we basically play a 4v2 possession game. So can the, the team with four, keep the ball off the team with two, like for, for maybe a minute or whatever, and then we can swap the two in the middle. So it's basically a moving piggy in the middle, or we can do um, four and four passes equals the score, or three if needed be, or if they're good, we might go six passes equals the score, it depends on your, on your players. And then the last bit of it then, we'll just evaluate the session. So we'll just have a little chat with, so like kids at eight don't really need to do a huge amount of flexibility work, but it's not a bad idea to just get them used to getting into the habit of this because they will need it when they're like, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, it'll, be, it'll become more important. But kids are generally very mobile. So we'll just get them into good habits here. And then we'll ask them, how did you go about dodging and evading? How do you hand pass? All that kind of stuff. And ask them questions about it so that they're so that they're thinking about it. So again, you can see in that session, it's 45 minutes. But like there's, you know, a good half of it is taken to athletic development. And that's appropriate given that they're eight and we're working on their fundamental movement skills. So we've worked on agility we've worked a little bit on balance we've worked a bit on hopping lunging all those kind of foundational movements we've got a lot of those in we've worked on reaction speed as well and then we're going into the technical and there won't be really a lot of tactics with under eights but um so that's that's our session just taking all that stuff in and then i love, our, I love that yeah. i love that template Teresa. you know in terms of it's and a lot of people here today have gone you know and they heard of the, the the term athletic development you know they're doing this stuff already it's just do it yeah. Do it well and and and, yeah. and don't underestimate the importance of these activities in particular at underage and we'll see a different session now in a minute but you know these these i suppose fishes and sharks and stepping stone courses and they're, they're very important and, and don't underestimate the importance they have in terms of developing that athletic development in kids from an early age group yeah and the thing is too that it's it's child appropriate so we're not doing like as many reps as possible or something really like we're not imposing an adult session on on kids so it has to be appropriate and if you can use like like there's animal movements and stuff like as well that you can do like can you can you move like a gorilla can you jump like a frog all that kind of stuff can you can you roll like a pig and muck all this kind of stuff that they absolutely love can you pretend you're a stork stand in one leg now go for a drink of water you're doing a straight leg deadlift but they don't need to know that like so they're just having fun, having their drink of water, standing on one leg, 
um, all that kind of stuff. So those that stuff that stimulates the kids' imagination, it's really important that it's done in a, in a, in a child appropriate way. Right, and then our last one then is one for an older group. So this is just a sample youth adult. So what are we looking for here? Technically, I'm looking for good kick passing and off the shoulder running. Um, the tactical challenge will be transition play from defense to attack. Um, from the physical end, we're going to look at speed and agility. We're going to look at mobility and stability as part of our warm up, anaerobic and anaerobic endurance. And we'll see that in the games part. Of it. And our psychosocial and his communication and working for the team. So just making those dummy runs into space that you're never going to get the ball for and, and all that kind of stuff, making, making room for other players or making space for other players. So we're going to work the ball out, out of defense down the wing. We're going to make space in the attacking wing for the ball to be delivered into. We want to deliver the ball via kick pass if we're technical. We want to support one off the shoulder and we want to create the scoring opportunity. So that's what I want at the end of this session. Oh, sorry. Right. So going back to Ray's, right, we're going to do a skills-based free movement warm-up. Again, there's loads of stuff you can do here, but this is, this is just one. So we're going to get all our players, whatever it is, 22, 24, into a 20 by 20 meter square. And we're going to perform all the skills of the game while moving and changing direction. So it's low level change of direction, pushing off left foot, pushing off right foot, using hand pass left and right, bounce left and right, solo left and right, high catch pick up, all those kind of things near hand tackle. And then what we'll do is we'll open it up a little bit and then we'll do a little bit of kick passing. Now, not mad kick passing, but just maybe 20, 30 meter passes, whatever it is. So we're getting to practice all the skills of the game. So we're combining the skills there with the raise part. So we will be, you know, we will have our heart rate, our respiratory rate, our core temperature, all that kind of stuff up. Um, and that will have achieved that, that, that part of the session. So then we're going to go into our activate and mobilize and we'll take our exercises here from the GA15, the C11 plus, whatever it is. And it's all this stuff here. So our dynamic stretching of the hammers, glutes, glutes, hip, calves, quads, all that kind of stuff, our lunges, our squats, our straight leg deadlifts, balance, jumping and landing and single leg hop and stick. And again, the importance of that and continuously doing that and challenging that and progressing that um, for female athletes, can't emphasize that enough. It's so important we do this stuff. Then we're going into potentiate before our training session. So we're just going to do four 10 meter accelerations with full recovery, which basically means that for every for every, what is it, for every second of work you do in a sprint, you get six seconds recovery. So five seconds work equals minimum 30 seconds recovery for speed work because it's not speed endurance we're developing here, it's just, it's speed. Then we might do 15 meter acceleration with a defender chasing. So now we're going a little bit more specific, right? We're gonna, we're gonna go maybe five meters in front of somebody and then we're gonna take off. So we're going to accelerate, but now we're bringing the ball into it as well. So you have to solo and, and get past certain lines or 10 meters in front while your defender is going to chase you. And then we might go another little bit, then we're going to do a 1v1 defender versus attacker in a channel. So we're looking at like uh, attacking agility and we're looking at defensive agility as well. So we're going to do them. So there's a total of 12, plenty of rest in between um, in that. Okay, so that's a little bit specific to, to the sport as well. And then we're just going to do a kick passing off the shoulder drill. That's just to kind of get them going before we go into our main games based stuff. Now, depending on the amount of footballs I put in there, depending on the size of, you know, the... The, the layout, like it could be a long kick, it could be a short kick off the, off the shoulder. We can really get acceleration and multi-speed stamina done here as well, depending on how we set that up. And um, then we're going into a 4v4 possession game on a 60 by 20 meter pitch. So it's a kick pass followed by a hand pass. Again, just linking in with, I'm looking at for kick passing um, and I'm looking for off the shoulder running here. And we're going to go for two four minute games there. And then we're going into our main games then. Um, and we're going to do this one called 5v2. Now what I should have said here was, we want the ball going down the wing from attack to defense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two channels down the outside and the ball has to go into that outside channel representing, representing the wing. So basically, if you gain possession of the ball in your own half, you get five passes before you have to, to shoot. So again, we're looking for that really quick movement, decoy runs, all that kind of stuff, moving the ball quickly and plenty of runs off the shoulder to support. And then if you get the ball in your own half, you have two passes in, in order to take a shot. And then keeping with the other thing then, um, Going to the next game then after that is going to be i'm going to give you 15 seconds to score so you do whatever you have to do but, but give creative scoring opportunity within 15 seconds so i'm looking here for the ball to be transferred from defense to attack really quickly and down the wings as well so again that's just the team in my session and then at the end of it then just going to do our static stretching and just key questions about the session what went well what do we need to improve on did we achieve what we were trying to achieve what will we do better next and that's basically our youth adult session but again there's plenty of athletic development in there in the warm-up and in our little bit of speed work and even within the drills and activities in the game we're getting all those fitness components the aerobic and anaerobic in there in the games and activities on that one treated as you go to the last slide and um, 
timing of, uh, of, of, of your activities is important. Um, you know, sometimes really let things run and run and run. You know, you, I see here you have like, we're going to do it for four minutes. We're going to do two of them for four minutes and stick into that. That's important from an, uh, I suppose, a, a physical development point of view that you're getting, you're maximizing, uh, I suppose, the physical aspect as well, which are, because it's four minutes, even for two minutes, therefore it's a different intensity. The, the, yeah. the varying of the time will, will determine the intensity of it as well. So timing of your activity is important. Yeah, it's it's hugely important. And that can be a challenge sometimes if you have someone on the coaching ticket who likes to talk a lot, because if you get too much rest, you're not going to get that aerobic or anaerobic development. So that is really important that we, we've, we've four minutes on, two minutes off or three minutes off. And again, as you progress through the season, you'll need extra rest at the start, but then it's you know following the principle of, of progressive overload right one of the ways we can progressively overload it is we can change the dimensions of the pitch we can change the number of players but we can also reduce the recovery time in between bouts as well so that that's important it's, it's one of those variables that we can we can use to control the intensity okay and the last bit then just just a, a wrap up of it so there's lots of very strong evidence out there to demonstrate that by coaching movement and running skills increasing our leg and trunk strength and by optimizing our landing and cutting and deceleration mechanics, we can significantly reduce injuries to the lower limb. And um, so the programs such as the GA15, the FIFA 11 plus and all those kind of things, they serve two purposes. They help reduce against injuries. Actually, I think I forgot to say there that like it's a 40% reduction in injuries, which is massive. Um, but the, the added bonus then is that it also serves for performance enhancement. So we're, we're going to be able to accelerate better. We're going to be able to land better. We're going to be able to change direction better as a result of doing these things. It needs to be done consistently and it, we need to put a, a big emphasis on, on technique that we're doing it actually properly, not just going through the motions. And I suppose if we spend our, our time early in the season or early in our athletic development pathway, perfecting that technique, well, then we will produce athletes with, with you know, greater athleticism and with less frequent injuries, we hope. <laughs> so that's it. <clears throat> You're muted there, Will. You're on mute there, Will. So sorry. So yeah, just before <laughs> we finish up, uh, there's a word two things have come true here. And, uh, and from Adrian, he says, would it be possible to get a copy of two sessions via email um, and save writing them out? Of course, Adrian. So yeah. send an email to me, william.harman at ljfa.ie, and we'll get those two sessions to you, Adrian. Just two ones here as well before we wrap it up in terms of uh, Finton asked a question. And I suppose it's something... You know, Finton, I've experienced ourselves. Recent studies seem to suggest a divergence of opinion of a cool down and stretch. What is the objective and recommended activities for a cool down, Teresa? I know in our own sessions, we probably don't do as much cool down as we used to do. Um, and I know that studies are going along the lines of probably questioning the cool down. And the other one is, uh, could I please ask, would ball wall activities suffice as a 15 minute warm up? So there's two questions for you now, Teresa. Cool down, what's your thought and on that? Um, I know studies are going the other way regarding the importance of it. And ball wall activities, would they suffice as a 15-minute warm-up? I suppose for the ball wall activities, it depends what you're doing in them. Um, like you will you will raise your heart rate and, and do all those kind of things and you raise your core temperature. Um, you would probably have to put in the activate and mobilize exercises with it. So for the first part of it, definitely would work. It would probably work as well for the potentiate if you did it a little bit. You know a little bit faster and a little bit quicker um so yeah but you you would have to put in your squats and lunges and stuff like that into this as well now as regards the cool down yeah that's that's an interesting thing so look we know the best two things for recovery are sleep and nutrition and the thing with the static stretching is it's very effective as long as it's done properly but most of the time it isn't so the whole point of i suppose the um the cool down is that when we train our muscles get shorter and tighter and the whole point of the cool down is that we stretch out and we restore our muscles to their, to their natural length. Now to do stretching properly, you need, it to do, you need to do it in conjunction with your breathing. And it's got to be like diaphragmatic or abdominal breathing. And there isn't a hope in hell that happens on the pitch. Like I know it's one, two, get to 10, have a big chat, get out of the cold <laughs> as quick as possible. And it, it's not done well. So um, yeah, but the big two things are, 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 um, are, are sleep and nutrition. Well, I still think it's a, a good thing to do to get into the habit of it because I don't know that I don't know, I, I think players just won't do it at all if, if you don't do something there on the pitch with them, even though it's not optimal and it's not ideal. 
Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, Francis McDonald says, should you stretch before training? Of course, Francis, and I suppose tonight what I've learned from trees is that it's dynamic stretching you're doing, trees. So it's all dynamic stuff, Francis. So trees, can you give an example of what a dynamic stretch might look like in terms of, you know, hamstring, how many seconds do you hold it for, that sort of stuff? Yeah, so it's generally like those those dynamic ones are, are like stretches on the move. So it's generally like about three to five seconds will be fine. Now, just in case if people are like tight or something like that, say if you're coming back from an injury, you feel your hammers are tight and you feel that you need to do that. The time to do that is actually before you do your potentiate and activate and mobilize. So do it before training, get your, your foam rolling and to get all that stuff done before you come to training or in the dressing room. But then once you've done your dynamic warm up and doing all those exercises, if you do static stretching after that, what it does is it reduces your power and speed outputs and you don't want that. So get that stuff if you need to do it. And I know some players do because like they're feeling very tight or whatever it is. So get that stuff done beforehand. And then once the dynamic stuff is done, you don't go back to the static then after that. Yeah, so dynamic, Francis. Dynamic yeah. is the buzzword there regarding your, yeah. your stretching. Yeah, look, thank you very much, Teresa. I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Even though, you know, it's a space I'd be in myself with coach education, I've learned an awful lot from that presentation, and, and, and thank you very much. I hope everybody tonight enjoyed the presentation. If you can in the uh, chat function, we would love to know what was your standout moment or your awe moment. In other words, what is something you learned uh, that you probably take into your next session or is what's something that struck you struck you uh, during the presentation? So please, guys, before you wrap up tonight, just put it in the, the chat function because we'd like to save them. Give us an idea of, of what of the learning that's went on. So on behalf of LJFA, I want to thank you very much, Teresa, for your preparation, your time. Oh, and your excellent presentation. The very best look at your coaching as well over the coming over the coming weeks and months. So on that note, guys, thank you very much for your time. And uh, this will be available on uh, our LGFA YouTube channel um, over the, the coming days. So be sure to, to tune in over the coming days. Thank you very much again. And we'll see you Thanks, guys. next week. Thank you. Thanks, guys.